will take up the first sessions we are going to discuss uh, the uh, patent ductus arteriosus that is the uh, basically shunt lesion but we are also going to discuss the obstructive lesion like uh, aortic stenosis uh, and uh, pulmonary stenosis mm -hmm. and uh, to, to discuss all these things we are uh, again having uh, the our experts uh, dr ramesh arora uh, so i would like to request dr ramesh arora kindly discuss this topic you all know that pda is a channel between aorta and the pulmonary artery as we can see here in the echo as well as in the angiogram now it's a large channel which is found in all mammalian fetuses which closes after birth but it may not close in about 8% of all congenital heart disease cases and this channel really connects between the mp and descending aorta about 5 to 10 mm distant to the origin of left subclavian artery now what exactly is the incidence of this that if the children if a child is born before the gestational term or the child is premature by weight then the frequency is more that is 45% of infants under the weight of 1750 g they have pda and those who are below 1200 g about 80% have pda not all of them are symptomatic few of them are symptomatic those who are asymptomatic one has to really wait that they have they reach their gestational period and majority of them can close but those who are symptomatic how to recognize a symptomatic pda in a premature neonate one can have a systolic murmur only or rarely a continuous murmur then presence of at least three of the following criteria that is a tachycardia more than 170 per minute bounding peripheral pulses hyperdynamic lb impulse tachypnea more than 70 per minute liver three fingers below costal margin and cardiomegaly if you have these features and the child is symptomatic then what do we do for them immediately indomethacin is given for the closure of pda the first dose is 0.2 mg per kg by intravenous or by the rail tube and the second dose is are 0.1 and 0.2 mg then along with that furosemide is given and one has to see that there is no renal failure child is not bleeding or child is not in shock this therapy obviates need for operative ligation in 70% but many a times one third of them they can reopen the dose can be repeated as well now those who present after 6 months of age the clinical features are that more common in females they come with recurrent bronchitis as i told you more than 4 per year or some of them may present in left ventricular failure physical development is usually poor more so in males than in females mind you disease is more in females but if a male child has it then the physical development is more usually poor in that peripheral pulse is water hammer like ear yeah, low diastolic pressure lv cardiac impulse which is hyperdynamic continuous thrill and murmur in the first and second space this is very easily recognized even the mother septa told us that they have been able to feel something abnormal on the chest then mid diastolic murmur which is a flow murmur and a functional murmur in large flows then if child develops pulmonary artery hypertension the murmur becomes smaller and smaller and only remains as ejection systolic murmur 
and at the same time can have a murmur of regurgitation which is early diastolic murmur. The two together at times can mimic a continuous murmur and again we get confusion that this is a continuous murmur or not. And once the clinical examination we suspect then go for the x-ray chest. Same thing as you can see that the LV type of apex pulmonary artery segment is prominent pulmonary plethora but as compared to VSDs and ASD the aorta is large in these cases. Looking at the ECG which can be normal for small PDAs but for the large PDAs left ventricular pattern is there that is LV preponderance. Echo is most diagnostic parasternal short axis view where you can see this is aortic valve in the aorta RV outflow pulmonary valve and this is pulmonary artery. Now the shunt has to come from aorta to the pulmonary artery and this is down below is a descending aorta. The shunt is coming like this towards the pulmonary artery and one can measure the edges of the patent ductus as you are seeing in the angiogram. At the same time put a Doppler and see that the flow is continuous or not. Once you have a Doppler try to see the maximum velocity and like a VSD try to find out the pulmonary artery hypertension is present or not. Then in a suprasternal view you can directly see the duct. This is pulmonary artery. This is ascending aorta arch coming down to descending aorta. After the subclavian you can see the turbulence. This is position of the duct. Now catheter position. Now same thing that we do not do any cardiac catheterization because it's easy to diagnose with the help of echocardiography and we do cath only for the closure of PDA. Nowadays almost all PDAs can be closed with the help of devices and it's not they are not given to the surgeons. Very few indications in very small infants are there where we give them to the surgeon for closure. You can see the catheter which is coming from the left arm to superior vena cava, right atrium, going to the right ventricle and from the right ventricle to pulmonary artery and across the duct into descending aorta. This is the situation. This is how it looks like in the PA view and this is how it's looking coming and from the pulmonary artery. This is the position of the duct most of the time and this is going to descending aorta. You can measure the pressures as well as. Now, we know the advantages of the transcatheter closure. Now, what are the indications for closure? The premature infants, those who do not respond to indomethacin and are symptomatic, those who are more than 10 days old and have a symptomatic PDA because they do not respond to indomethacin. Infants and children after the age of six months, all sizes with or without significant shunt and with or without symptoms, they need to be closed because we want to avoid infective endocarditis, congestive heart failure, pulmonary vascular disease and aneurysm formation. Even in adults, whether they are symptomatic or not, there are various series which are being shown here that they have said that if you close them, it's better to avoid the complications. And this I'll show you. This was one of our own patient, 12-year-old child who had infective endocarditis in the past. Look at the small duct that baby had. And at the age of 12, the child has presented with a big aneurysm of the pulmonary artery. The child had to be given for cardiopulmonary bypass to remove all this area and then close the duct. Otherwise, he could have had a transcatheter closure without any scar. Now, various devices which have come are that the Reshkin umbrella device came to us in 1987, but at the moment, these devices are no more used, only coils for small and it, with the help of the implants or occluder, we can close all size of ducti. This is to show that a small neonate who most of the time they have a coarctation along with the duct. So coct is open and the duct is being taken care of and try to see that the device remains within the duct in such children because if it abuts onto the aorta it can produce coarctation. Now this is uh, just to show how the implanted occluder is being implanted. This is just from the aorta. We are trying to inject and see the size and site of the duct. This is passing from the femoral vein, from the pulmonary artery down. This is the size of the 
outside of the duct and down into descending aorta, the device in the delivery sheet. And then the device has been released on the duct and device is here without the control from your hand and it's lying in the duct. So this is, it's very easy to do it. And now if you look at the echo, you see how in the parasternal short axis view as we were seeing, this is aorta. This is main pulmonary artery, right pulmonary artery, close to the left pulmonary artery is the attachment and from descending aorta, you, we have deployed this and see this is how the device looks like. Sometimes they are very small and even the coils can be used because this is was exactly used most of the time for the cost problem rather than anything else. Then there are very small children who are there who have a very large duct and their aorta is 8 millimeter or 10 millimeter. Their duct is also 8 millimeter window type of a duct. You cannot put the regular device, especially design device like a VSD where there is a cut so that it does not abut onto the aorta and doesn't cause coarctation. You see that this baby was 3.5 kg very large duct of 8 millimeter. The aorta is as big as the size of the duct and the device cut device has been given so that it doesn't go to the aorta. In the other view you can see that aorta is free of device and the duct has been closed in a 3.5 kg child which is a very large duct. Sometimes the there are very large ducti and they have pulmonary artery hypertension and the regular devices are not used and the VSD device can be used because it's slightly more firm. Just to show you the 500 cases, this is just to show the results, how the results are, not for anybody author, but this is to show that 99.5% can be closed at the moment. Second device is putting is possible, it's a safe efficacious procedure for all sizes of PDA and appropriate devices to be chosen and for children who are less than 8 kg modified device which is actually a custom made device by the manufacturer and large trials are really needed with the newer trials at times but now most of these cases not, no trials are needed and they are being done and the therapy of choice. Now when do we do surgical closure? In small infants who are less than 5 kg and we look at the ampulla which cannot receive the coil also, so they are the ones who are dumb. Then those who are less than 5 kg and the ampulla is more than 4 millimeter, and those who have less than 10 kg and the duct size is more than 6 millimeter. So very specific indications are there for the surgical closure, but rest all of the cases are being taken. So the recommendation of the procedure depend upon the available infrastructure and expertise of the particular technique. Apart from their, these cases, we have very rare cases who also present with a continuous murmur systolo-diastolic along the left sternal border where you have ruptured sinus serval salva fraud from the aorta into the RV or into RE and these cases can also be closed just like a VSD closure I showed you. Then this was a patient who had a PDA closure and then the PV was blue. You have to keep watching them and everybody said it's a methemoglobinemia but when the good echo machines came it was seen that there was LPA to LA fistula and that's how the baby was blue which was also closed. Some adults present with chest pain and they have a coronary arteriovenous fistula because there is a steel from the coronary artery to the right ventricle the blood steel is there and thus the coronary flow is reduced and they come with a chest pain. Many people do not examine them well, they think this is a chest pain, so it's a angina, so go take it for coronary angiogram. The patients are taken and then this is what you see and these fistulas can also be closed. These are the extended closures or extended indications of the devices which have been designed for ASD, VSD and PDAs. The obstructive lesions means they are no sham. The obstructive lesions can be on the right side of the heart or they can be on the left side of the heart and they are grouped as ventricular outflow obstructive lesions that is aortic stenosis, pulmonary stenosis, coarctation, peripheral PS or there can be stenosis of the atrioventricular valves that is ventricular inflow tract obstruction, congenital mitral stenosis with a supravalar ring or 
a membrane in the LA which is called cord triatratum or rarely isolated TS which doesn't occur as such without being involvement of the mitral valve. Now, if we go on to the pulmonary stenosis, we know that the pulmonary valve, which can be seen on echo here, that there can be valvular stenosis, there can be infundibular stenosis, or there can be a supravalvular stenosis. This stenosis accounts for about 8 to 10 percent of congenital heart disease. The decrease in the siblings is 3 percent. Mild ones are 38 percent, and that is means that the peak systolic gradient across the valve is less than 50 moderate about 25% with the peak gradient up to 74 and severe ones are with the peak gradient more than 75. Sometimes they have a Noonan syndrome which has a dysplastic valve and the secondary changes can occur with the valvular stenosis causing dynamic infundibular stenosis which really doesn't occur as an isolated lesion. Again mild and moderate cases are asymptomatic but if this is severe, then effort dyspnea and even angina because of right ventricular hypertrophy and obstruction to the right coronary artery, syncope because of the low output can occur in these cases. They have full and bloated moon faces. These children, they look very sweet because they have very prominent good eyes and moon-like face. If you see the JVP, A wave is raised and this A wave is really dancing in the venous uh, column like a corrigan sign of aortic regurgitation. On cardiovascular system examination, it's a right ventricular impulse which is heaving with a left parasternal heave and on auscultation there is ejection systolic murmur which is usually preceded by ejection click. This ejection click, if it is close to very first heart sound, it means it is severe. If it is slightly away, it means it is mild. We have to really look for the ejection systolic murmur, how it is. If it ends before A2, it is mild PS. If it ends at A2, it is moderate. If it crosses, it is severe. When it is moderate, it produces a diamond-like picture and when it is severe, it is an inverted kind. Second heart sound is split. P2 is weak. Many times it is not appreciated also. Look at the moon faces of an individual, x-ray chest, small um, mild uh, PS and their pulmonary artery segment is prominent, not much of pulmonary oligemia, normal size heart. Look at the large heart in a sphere PS with a pulmonary segment prominent and oligemia in the peripheral fields. Now ECG shows the right ventricular hypertrophy right axis deviation as you can see lead 1 and you can see AVF as well and AVR. Then right ventricular hypertrophy in the form of QR pattern with uh, strain pattern is there. This height of R wave can tell us what is the pressure in the right ventricle. If you see the R wave and you see that how many millimeters it is, supposing it is 10 multiplied by 5 which means that the RV pressure is 50, that means it is a mild uh, PS. If it is more than that, then you can keep on grading and finding out from the ECG itself what is the degree of stenosis. Echo is most useful. Here you can see that there is infundibular PS which, which is secondary and there is a valve which is doming. One can see it very clearly and this is a gradient across. There is a 5.7 millimeter per second is the velocity which means that the gradient is more than 100 in this patient. Once we have echo and we have diagnosed this and then what is the treatment? Treatment at present is not surgical treatment as present is only by balloon valvoplasty. Surgical treatment really had a very bad mortality which was up to the tune of 20 percent or so and whereas with the help of balloon hardly any mortality is there. Once you have seen that the echo shows that the peak systolic gradient is 60 or more, the candidate is taken for valvoplasty. This is an angiogram which is being seen and there how from the femoral vein we come to the right atrium, right ventricle, try to go across the pulmonary artery and put a balloon over it. The balloon site selected is about same size or 100 to 
140% more than the annulus diameter. This is inflation. Try not to inflate in the infundibular area because that can produce a spasm. Now you can see the angiogram that there is and no stenosis at all. The success is very high. Mortality is hardly there. But if patients do not present in childhood and they come in the adulthood, then they can have infundibular stenosis which may remain after velloplasty and regress later on. 95% can regress but few of them can remain and if you have seen that out of 260 cases, 3 cases for infundibular stenosis had to be given for surgery. Neonates when they present in the very first month with congestive heart failure, they are very bad candidates and they are a real challenge because there is a large cardiomegaly, there is TR and it is difficult to cross from the RA to the RV and then to the pulmonary artery. They have a critical PS with, and many a times we have to take very small balloons, sometimes the coronary balloons to do the graded dilatation and if the duct is patent, it's good to give prostaglandin to keep the duct patent so that the circulation to the body is maintained and you can continue with your procedure. Sometimes there is a real atresia, no flow is seen and there is a membrane which can be ruptured with the laser or RF radio frequency catheter or even with this guide wire which we have in the cath lab, the inner core of that which is hard, it can really open it up. Now, infundibular stenosis which accounts for about 8 to 10 percent of the cases and it really doesn't occur as an isolated lesion. Most of the time following VSD there is on follow-up we see that there is infundibular stenosis. This is, child really had a VSD closure and a patch was put across RV to pulmonary artery. With the sternal depression there is a stenosis of the RV to PA conduit. Now how to open it? You cannot go back to the surgery because the sternal depression is not going to improve. This is a child who had pulmonary atresia. Well, what me has been done and the valve has been opened, but the infundibular stenosis never regressed. So, not to give the child again for surgery, there has been a RVOT balloon dilatation and a stent has been deployed to do. Now, apart from the uh, there can be a main pulmonary artery stenosis, there can be peripheral artery stenosis. Most of the time it is in association with PS or with tetralogy of fellows. This is the main pulmonary artery which is stenotic, balloon dilatation and deployment of the stent to maintain it. Post-op case of tetralogy and once they have finished, they cannot, the surgeons cannot see this. They can only see up to the cardiac and the first branches of the right and the left pulmonary artery and these are peripheral branches which are being seen and uh, put a wire across balloon and you can stent this lesion. Now next going on to the aortic stenosis which accounts for 3 to 6 percent of all congenital heart diseases. This can also be valvular, subvalvular or supravalvular. So, valvular one mostly it's a bicuspid aortic valve which is fused or the subvalvular, they can have a discrete membrane which can be a thin or thick or they can be fibromuscular tunnel. Same way supravalvular can also have a membrane or the whole of the aorta can be hypoplastic. Supravalvular is mainly associated with Williams syndrome which is an autosomal dominant uh, disorder and has elfin phases, hypercalcemia, mental retardation, growth is deficient, hyperacusis and anomalies of the dental development. Associated anomalies with supravalvular can be peripheral artery stenosis, coarctation and extra cardiac is inguinal hernia. If you look at this is how the William syndrome phases are. <coughs> Clinical features same way, mild cases are asymptomatic, the growth is normal, really is not recognized, but severe cases they have fatigue, exertional dyspnea, angina and syncope. Less frequently pain in abdomen, epistaxis and profuse sweating. Main features are a good A wave in the neck, small volume anacrotic pulse and LV cardiac impulse because it is a LV forces which are going to be increased which is heaving not hyperdynamic with pre-systolic expansion. Second sound is closely split or reverse S3 in children and presence of S4 in any patient who is at the age of 40 or so signifies a severe obstruction. 
these patient service systolic thrill and ejection systolic murmur and i'll show you how the phono and the carotid traces they look like there is a phono which you can see in a mild case the murmur is not very large the murmur becomes almost a diamond shape like a ps in a case of a moderate and a very large inverted type but this is more characteristic in pulmonary stenosis than aortic they are preceded by ejection click in a valvular case but in its supravalvular and subvalvular the ejection click is absent and supravalvular does not have ar whereas subvalvular they can have aortic regurgitation the characteristic is the carotid trace this is the carotid trace which is normally right from the base to the apex there is no notch if the notch is more towards the apex it is a mild it is coming more and more closer to the baseline it is moderate and if it's really touching really the baseline it is a real sphere you can see as it is becoming sphere the upstroke is less and the pulse volume is becoming narrow <coughs> pressure is narrow so the pulse is becoming small volume right from the mild to moderate to sphere case x-ray chest nothing remarkable but left ventricular apex ecg left ventricular hypertrophy with strain and characteristic aortic stenosis echo you can see here a parasternal long axis you can see this green color coming down is ar and the red which is going up across this narrow orifice is the one which is showing you the aortic stenosis you can confirm it with the m mode systolic phase and the diastolic phase with the help of this view one can see whether the cusps are two or three there's a bicuspid or a tricuspid valve as well then put a doppler and see what is the gradient across the aortic valve once you have done that by cardiac catheterization one can confirm and this is the lv trace and this is the aortic stent if you have this type of a trace it may only mean that the there is a gradient across the aortic valve which can be subvalvular also and so a withdrawal trace is necessary rather than a simultaneous trace and the echo of a subaortic membrane you can see this is a valve parasternal view again and membrane is being seen the thickness of membrane is important if the membrane is 3 mm or more in thickness then it cannot be opened with the help of balloon dilatation surgery is required a trace which is from the you can see that the lv is more is a outflow and this is aorta which means that the gradient is in the subvalvular area now supravalvular how it looks in the parasternal long axis is that this is the aortic valve and the suprasternal view you can see that the aorta is becoming small or glass type of an appearance this is how the trace looks from lv to the upper part of aorta and again up to the upper part which means aorta to aorta gradient supravalvular now small neonates when they present they present in congestive heart failure they are very sick they have to be kept on prostaglandin as well as anti congestive therapy prostaglandins are given to keep the duct patent for their survival and they are mostly on ventilatory support their mortality is very high even the operative mortality used to be high which has fallen but still it is very high so the balloon dilatation which was started in 1989 is the treatment of choice for these small children but all cannot be taken up we have to see that their annulus size is at least up to 8 mm to be taken up if that is less then we have to give the patient for surgery or for cardiac transplantation this is how we cross the balloon right from the femoral artery aorta to the lv and first put a wire and then a balloon sometimes two balloons if the annulus is large almost a 100% success but the point is can we maintain this or not 70% of the patients they remain free from operation at the age of 8 years and freedom from interventions after 8 years is in 50% the patients who are being taken for balloon valvoplasty they were less than 20 years of age but if the results are good and the patients who do not have a calcified valve then where is the age limit should we cut off really at 20 or we can do a 22 as well the criteria have never been given anywhere but if you do not want surgery then one can do balloon valvoplasty for them and follow them up 
Now, this is a supravellar osmosis. If you put a balloon, it's very difficult to do a supravellar aortic stenosis if it is a very elongated. Now you can see right from the aortic valve onwards, half of the ascending aorta is narrow. So balloon dilatation is not enough. So stent deployment is being done. Otherwise, the surgeon has to put a prosthetic graft right from the root up to the narrowing portion or the hole of the arch at times. Sometimes they have to take the aortic valve also because the aorta annulus is hypoplastic in these cases. Now, can this is good that you can replace the valve by surgery and that is the treatment of choice for the most of the cases with a calcified valve. But can we do a percutaneous deployment of the aortic valve? The whole story started with the Cribier et al. and his team who did the first human implant by the percutaneous technique in April 202. And you can see that there is a stent with a, by, with a leaflet valve inside, which is a porcine valve sutured with the help of a small cloth. And this is being the crimped valve. And this is how we do a transeptal puncture, go to the valve and position the valve. A lot number of procedures now have been done. Previously, all cases who were not fit for surgery, they were being taken up. That is, they had comorbid situations and the anesthesia cannot be given to them, high mortality from surgery. But now they are coming up and the things are being devised. Can we do in good risk cases also? Of the total 500 cases procedures so far done, the success rate has increased up to 96% and procedure mortality is 2%. Whereas in the same group of patients, a 30-day mortality would have been 28% uh, by the Euro score if surgery was to be done because they are all high-risk candidates, whereas with the help of um, percutaneous, it has been 12%. This has been a stent deployment and if you can see this was our own patient which we did and sometimes you do not have to take a balloon expandable stent, self expandable valve is, stents are also available within that there is a valve and there is being deployed. So this is what the, being done in the cath lab nowadays and the procedures are becoming more and more successful with less of mortality. Now, surgeons did realize that their part is being taken up by the cardiologist now, so they are coming up to the mini thoracotomy, whereas a small incision is given in the left, for fifth left intercostal space, and right from the LV apex, the needle puncture is done, and the valve is being positioned with the help of intravascular ultrasound, and they are coming up to that. Nearly 200 cases have been done by them. So the question is that we have to try and see which cases we can do by the less invasive technique so as to give high benefit to the patient with the less of risk and try to choose your patient accordingly. Last topic which we are coming is the coarctation of aorta, which you know that the, the word coarctation means pressed together. And here we have um, the coarcted segment which is after the subclavian artery but the duct is open which means it is an infantile and these cases do not live for a very long time. This is the one after the subclavian uh, but post duct, the duct is closed and these cases have longer life and they are the ones who present to us most of the time. The last one is not to be seen but if I can show you this is aortic atresia only. So how do we classify coarctation of aorta? The site can be pre-subclavian, isthmus, which can be infantile or adult, low distal, that is descending thoracic aorta, and sometimes below the diaphragm, 2% of the cases. The nature can be abrupt, elongated, or hooked. This is how in the angiogram the postductal coct looks like without any duct. Associated anomalies are fibroelastosis, bicuspid aortic valve, aortic stenosis, PDA, mitral stenosis, VSD, and anomalous origin of right subclavian below the coarcted segment. Two thirds of the cases are asymptomatic. Minor symptoms are epistaxis, headache, discomfort from throbbing in the neck, and migraine. Sometimes there is pain around the shoulder girdle, which is because of the pressure effect of the collateral vessels. 
claudication in the lower limbs in 5% of the cases. Major symptoms are because of the complications and they are left ventricular failure, congestive heart failure, CVA or sometimes sudden death from aortic rupture. Physical signs are excessive pulsations of the carotids. We can delay femoral pulses because there is a coarctation below the subclavian and left sub, um, subclavian artery is weak in preductal coarctation whereas the right subclavian artery is weak if there is anomalous origin. There is hypertension in the upper limbs and there are visible pulsations at the back which is called Sussman sign. If you can see in this gentleman at the back there are visible pulsations and these collaterals are palpable as well as the brewery can be heard over it. If we examine the cardiovascular system, the LV cardiac impulse, there is aortic systolic murmur which is initiated by ejection click most of the time because of the bicuspid aortic valve and dilated aorta. Sometimes because of the flow there is mid diastolic murmur at the apex. The third important murmur is at the back in the interscapular region that is the murmur which is across the duct, the coarcted segment and this can be either systolic or systolodiastolic. Brui is heard in the interscopical regions, retinal arteries are tortuous and there can be hemorrhages because of hypertension. X-ray is very very important, one can see that the, the cardiomegaly is not there but if you do a penetrated view or you take a barium swallow, you can see an inverted figure of 3. This is dilated subclavian, this is the coarcted segment and this is postrenotic dilatation. And you can also see, you can not appreciate here, but the, you can see the dog sign that is there is notching of the lower margins of the ribs. Now, again, echo is important, suprasternal view showing the quartic segment as turbulence and you can measure how much is the gradient. This is after the quark trace and this is before the quark trace. You can see the difference between the two. If there is a difference of 50 or more, then these children are taken up. LV aortic root angio showing an infantile quark and this is also a infantile but this is really extending showing that the whole aorta, aortic arch is very small in these children. Postductal quark. Now what do we do for them? This is a postductal quark which is being shown and you can see that this is a coarcted segment. We cross from the femoral artery with the help of a wire. We put a balloon across and you can see that the stent has been put across and the stent is being opened. There are two balloons inside this stent, smaller one to position it and the larger one to really inflate it to the size of aorta. If the gradient is more with the balloon, then the stent can be deployed. But if gradient is less than 10, then there is no need to deploy any stent in these cases. Now, this is the patient of coarctation where the stent was deployed, but there is an aneurysm behind it. You can see this aneurysm can rupture across the stent and there can be dreaded complications. So, within the stent, another stent has been put which has a covering inside so that the, it doesn't allow it to rupture. Now, within the neonates, they have a congestive heart failure and hypertension and surgery is associated with a high mortality and criteria we have to take that at least 30 millimeter gradient is there for them to take up for angioplasty. This is, I showed you earlier also, that this is a coarcted segment in the neonate where along with the duct, the duct has been crossed and capped and then the dilatation of the coarcted segment and at the same time the duct has been closed. The other surgical repair, if we cannot do anything, then the, the surgical repair which was being done was end-to-end -end repair. Cut the segment and do end-to-end -end repair or make a longitudinal incision on the aorta and do a patch angioplasty which has better results because obstruction is not there uh, in this as compared to that. The last we have is a coarctation of aorta as a surgical repair in which the flap from the subclavian artery is brought down and it is repaired. We have to see that we do not <coughs> 
cause um, complication in these cases and the complication of natural course of coagulation as I've been telling you who present with symptoms are aortic rupture. Aortic rupture can occur just below the coagulated segment or even of the ascending aorta can show you dissection and this occurs in 20% of the cases with an average age of 25 years. Infective and arthritis which occurs in 16% of the cases and the age is 29. CVA that is cardio, actually intracranial hemorrhage occurs and with 12% and age of about 28. You can see all these are in the third decade. Congestive heart failure in the fourth decade and incidental cause of death is at the age of 47 in 22. So the majority of these cases, this come by the age of 20 to 40 years and the average age of death in these cases is 35 years. Apart from these coagulation of aorta, we have other lesions of mitral valve as I was telling you. Then sometimes there is a supravalvular ring which can be opened with the help of balloon and quadriatratum, they are all very rare and uh, things which do occur in small children and they, they can be diagnosed easily with the help of echocardiography. Most of the time they are surgical candidates rather than with the, they can be opened with the help of balloon. This is how I think we finish our um, whole lecture for this. Actually my idea was to deal with the conditions which are common and which we commonly see and they come come across in the practice at the moment thank you yeah thank you very much ma'am uh, i think uh, in these sessions we have discussed uh, the uh, earlier sound lesion like our, our pulmonary uh, uh, pattern ductus arteriosus and uh, yeah, uh, and also like obstructive lesion like uh, pulmonary stenosis, aortic stenosis and uh, coagulation of aorta and uh, the main uh, things which ma'am uh, was telling you are, uh, again and again was you have to really identify uh, the cases and how to proceed the things is the most important all these things uh, like latest procedures ma'am shows you just to inform you about the latest development so that you you are little bit aware about these things and you can suggest your patient accordingly so here we would like to uh, conclude these sessions thank you very much to all of you